Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night wherever you are around the world. Welcome to the final, the championship match of Pro Tour Gate Crash 2013. Rich Hagen, Brian David Marshall and Luis Scott Vargas with you. BDM, what have we got? We have blue, white, red, Reckoner Control on one side good. leading off against Tom Martel playing the Aristocrats. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, cartel aristocrats and Falcon Rath aristocrats doing disgusting things to doom travelers and champions of the parish. Yeah, and it's it's weird because not very many people really know everything Martel's deck is capable of. <laughs> Possibly even Martel, though I imagine at this point he's got a pretty good idea of it. So it's going to be interesting to see how Droll responds to, like, the, the synergies that Tom's trying to right. set up. We, we really haven't seen those Skears deck High Priests in action yet in any of these matches. Yeah, though I don't think this is the matchup for them as much, just because uh, Joel has so much cheap removal and the board isn't really as likely to get stalled. But uh, he's definitely going to be leaning on, like, the, 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 Vamp the Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, which is, you know, as always, one of the biggest cards in his deck. So we're away with Augra Bolas on the left of your screen for Joel Larson. That picked him up and unsummoned. And Knight of Infamy on the right for Tom Martel. Joel's hands developed pretty nicely here. He kept a, a hand with two lands and some augers, but he's drawn a couple more lands. So his angel and his uh, his various charms will, will have a chance to do some work. And, and that unsummon actually looks pretty nice in this matchup against something like a Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. Mm -hmm. And Searing Spear, one of the reasons I think Joel is slightly favored here is that he's got a bunch of cards like Searing Spear and Pillar of Flame, which do a good job of pinpointing, isolating Martel's good cards from his enabler cards. We could be in for a very exciting matchup here. Certainly, uh, the cover at live polls, they have it pretty much 50-50. Sam Black thinks Martel might take this one out. We'll see how things pan out. <laughs> Sam might have a vested interest. <laughs> you think? Sam Black, of course the principal designer of this deck uh, using Sam's favorite mechanic, sacrificing creatures to one another. And Sam was here a year ago, as it were, with the finals of Proto Revisin restored for Gedenis Vidagiris. That occasion, Alexander Hayne proved triumphant. So, Lingering Souls for the first time from Tom Martell, a couple of Spirit Tokens. Pretty sure Tom Martell never leaves his apartment without some Lingering Souls <laughs> tokens. You never know what might happen. That's right. He can't really attack into the augers here. Joel has telegraphed uh, the unsummon a little bit by playing untapped steam vents, but it is certainly something he considered worth it. Wizard. Wizard. On Cavern, past the turn from Joel. So he's got Restoration Angel Manor up, and as you can see on the right of your screen, he has Restoration Angel available. He's, he's close to having Blasphemous Act Manor up. Yeah, and Blasphemous Act. Uh, <laughs> Fairly effective against a lot of Tom's boards, though. If he has an aristocrat out, well, either one, he, they, they do get to survive. But, but I, I think uh, Larson's deck is set up that, you know, he can he can deal with one aristocrat. It's like when the whole family shows up, that <laughs> right. things get out of hand. Yeah, when uh, Martel has this whole council of advisors <laughs> there, then uh, he's in trouble. But if he can leave Martel with just one attacker, then a revelation is just going to be enough to put him too far ahead. Tom doesn't even have a great attack here if he fears Angel, which he uh, obviously has to be thinking about. I mean, he, if he ends up having to, like, Orzov charm the Angel mid-combat, which it looks like he might, it kind of makes the rest of his turn not quite as good. So in come the two Lingering Souls tokens, half of that card, and Joe Larson, as you'd expect, flashes in Restoration Angel, says, I'd like to uh, exile, just for a moment, my oh. Order of Bolas. Has, even has choices here. Takes Pillar of Flame, a card you pointed to when we were looking over lists. You were like, yeah. that card. Yeah, Pillar pretty of Flame is, 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 is pretty good because it just does its part to disrupt Martel's deck from really getting its engine going. Martel then says, Orzov of Charm, and Joel just wants to read the text on that one. So then Martel gets to like flashback of Lingering Souls, but Joel could at any point pull the trigger here. I was a little surprised he didn't take the Boros Charm over to Pillar, just because he, he has so much burn in his hand, he could actually just straight burn Martel out. But he actually isn't that far away anyway. Yeah, Tom, Tom falls to 12 from that uh, from that Orzov Charm. Yeah, he'd be one point away if he had Boros Charm. He's three points away now, which is actually any burn spell but the other Pillar, or a Snapcaster Mage. So it would not be unreasonable for Joel just to like Blasphemous Act here, though. He's not taking a ton of damage yet. You really want to act before the Falcon Wrath Aristocrat shows up. Right. And, and it's worth noting that if he draws a Boros Reckoner, yeah. um, that represents 
a game ending situation for Tom Bartow. Well, it's tough because if he holds the act and Tom draws a Reckoner, then Joel no longer can cast Blasphemous Act. Right. These two points of damage also might be really important. Like, Tom is aware that, you know, Joel has a lot of burn spells in his deck. But his blocks are still not very good. In order to, he has to either chump or trade, like, a Knight of Infamy for an Augur, which is not really a situation you want to be in. And this is really a game I think Tom has to get in this matchup because once you go to the sideboarded games, oh, yeah. those lingering souls either take a seat on the bench or they're going to just get um, completely dominated by Thundermaw. Yeah, Kites. Thundermaw and also Supreme Verdict. Even though Wraths aren't at their best against Tom, I mean, Joel does have the option to bring him in. And Thundermaw is going to be a, like a windmill slam. It's like one of his best cards in the matchup. So you really see this as a, a must-win game one for Martel? I mean, I think, I think it's... a. a, a Pretty, pretty substantial. Obviously, every game is substantial, but this seems like the one he's best uh, positioned in. So he's, he he got his two points of damage, and now he's just going to act to clear the board. He's one point of burn away from killing Tom. All Tom has to do is play another Shocklander, or Joel to draw a Snapcaster, or Pillar, Snap, or a Searing Spear, or Boros Charm. Yeah, that was a lot of or 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 or. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's got options. Tom to avoid. And Tom does not have any life gain in his deck, it looks like, so he's, he's basically on a, on a pretty quick clock here. I doubt Tom is going to take damage off any of his lands, though. I mean, he, he, again, he's well aware that preserving his life total is, is critical right. here. Does he want to... So he, he went champion, champion. Does he... Any consideration to, like, Falconrath Aristocrat and attacking there? Well, he knows Joel has a pillar. In hand, and if he wants to play a champion and an aristocrat, he has to take two from Sacred Foundry. So you don't want to take two because you might get burned out, and you don't want to just have a, an aristocrat with no backup because otherwise you're you're in much bigger trouble. So the Pillar of Flame takes out the larger of the two champions, leaving just the one one. And the champion serves as sort of a vitamin there for Tom Martell. Yeah, though all it does is cut off Pillar of Flame because any of the three or four damage spells still end the game here. Though. Joel doesn't actually have anything else going on, so Tom may be able to force him to, to use one of those burn spells here. Though Unsummon Azorius Charms certainly do their fair share of buying time. <laughs> like, I, I imagine Martel's next couple turns are going to involve Castic Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, possibly the same one. <laughs> so, there we go. Joel looks at a grip of four. Two burn spells, two bounce spells. Amongst other modes. Yeah, Joel does buy less time if he cycles with Azorius Charm, but again, he's got so many outs to just win the game, I have to imagine he's at least considering it. Tom playing around Restoration Angel, but not sending in Champion. Pretty reasonable. Getting Angel here would be devastating. Oh, interesting. He's, he's, he's going to, to burn out the, the Aristocrat here. There it goes. So he unsummons the Champion of the Parish, so that it's, he says, are you going to sacrifice it? And if yeah. he sacrifices it, he can do something in response. Oh, that was a huge draw. Reckoner represents oh, the exact right. amount of damage he needs. I mean, given the, the one spear is gone, but Reckoner is just a recurring damage source that Tom has multiple turns he has to set up if he wants to Hurts. conscript with plus a risk credit. Let me see, an Orzov charm has uh, joined Tom's hand. He does have the two charms for infinite life here, by the way, when we look at Morrison's hand. <laughs> if Tom taps out, he might go for it, but with an aristocrat in play, Tom can not do damage to the Reckoner. And with Orzov Cham in hand, I don't think Joel's going to go for it into an Orzov charm. Oh, no, no. He's like not. too far ahead. But if he does go off, he does actually win. I don't think Tom can de <laughs> deck him before getting burned out. But Joel has to be aware of it. I don't know how many times he's infinited during the tournament. He, he says it's happened a couple times. Yeah, I mean, it's a thing. He said most of the time, though, he said, I could have, but I'd rather just Boris Charm their face. Yeah, uh, also a thing. <laughs> yeah, so two cards for Larson. You see them on your screen. And Tom Martell trying to get this back down and in. So now that it's attacking, the Azorius Charm becomes live. Yeah, but... Again, with the infinite combo uh, potential here, Joel may not want to just, yeah, he might just take it. Because mm -hmm. now if Martel doesn't block, Joel can be three points closer to killing him. Oh, well, that, that, that's pretty bad for Tom. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. Joel has eight points of burn now, so. 
that's interesting that Tom, just as we say, Joe's <laughs> during Snapcast, and Tom's like, well, let me take a look at your <laughs> graveyard. I was like, was that a read? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Joel, it didn't look like Joel did anything. Tom just has to respect the possibility at sure. all times. Just, just well, as it happens. He's thinking about whether or not he's going to block, yeah. block and sack. I mean, he has to worry that Joel's last two cards are burned. He doesn't know uh, about the other two cards here, I don't believe. And uh, we know that those cards are Snapcaster Mage, Azorius Charm, and Boris Charm, while Tom is sitting on Zealous Conscripts of Resolve for Charm. Though, did he reveal Bor I know he revealed the Azorius Charm off the second Augur, off the first Augur. Did he actually reveal Boris Charm? I didn't catch what happened there. I don't believe so. Because otherwise, Tom won't, won't actually have, be aware of which one, uh, what he has got going. No, I don't believe Tom knows. Okay, so Tom has to block here, or he, he does just lose the game on the spot. Even if he does, Joel's in a fairly commanding position, though it's much, much closer. No blocks. All right, well. <laughs> Joel <laughs> has a look at his graveyard. <laughs> yeah. And passes the turn. I mean, he's got the win in his hand, but I imagine he's sl he wants Martell maybe to tap out again, or maybe just when he's forced to use it, he'll use it. Otherwise, he will not. I think so. Tom has drawn Vault of the Archangel. Wow. Which is a gorgeous, gorgeous card. Yeah. But not necessarily right now. <laughs> it's funny, because that's one of the cards Martell does actually want to draw. That is the one life gain okay. card I, I missed from looking at uh -huh. his spells. But uh, if he uses it, Joel has actually like no choice but to go for it, which ends up being not, not exactly great for Tom. There you see it. Death Touch and Lifelink. Zealous Conscripts targeting your Boros Reckoner. And now I guess I'll kill you. I, mean, I, I assume his mana works right. It gets, yeah, it's a Cavern on Wizard and all the lands are dual lands, so. So what is Joe thinking about here? Is there a reason not to just seven him here? I mean, he, he's probably going to. Maybe he's just letting him have the Reckoner first. <laughs> yep. I mean... Unless something very strange is going on, I, I imagine Joel Larson wins the game right now. Again, let's take a look at his hand. <clears throat> Boros Charm, which is four damage. Snapcaster Mage, which can uh, give flashback to Searing Spear, which is three damage, yeah. which adds up to... Seven health damage. Yeah. Also, Boros Charm, just cast Boros Charm, Snapcaster, cast Boros Charm. Sure. Uh, if yeah. you want to get to it that way, you yeah, can do yeah. that too. Slow rolling. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. I was slow rolling. He actually said the words, I was slow rolling in <laughs> the final of a pro tour. And wow. So Tom does a quick mana check. Now, was he actually slow rolling, or did he just, I, I think was he, he might just have said, in I, his head? I think he might have said, yeah, I don't want to slow roll you. Oh, okay. Like, now that you're tapped out, I want to <laughs> go for it. Maybe, I mean, Tom has a lot of strange cards in his deck. 1 0 to Joe Larson. Can't wait to try out new standard and booster draft strategies straight from the Pro Tour? Log on to Magic Online and take part in special standard spotlight events, standard two-person gold queues, and Gatecrash limited tournaments all weekend. For more information, visit mtgonline.com. All right, boys, time to earn your keep because we're down to two players. They are staring at 15 sideboard cards that they might put in. We're going to take a look at them on the screen. And you're going to tell us what you think they might do. So uh, let's see if we can take a look at the two sideboards of the players. And we begin with Joel Larson. So, uh, Luis, what do you reckon we're, we're doing here? Well, he's definitely bringing the two Thunder Maws and the Pillar. Uh, I think Supreme Verdict, I mean, it's bad against Falconrath Aristocrat, and it's not great against Obzidat, the Ghost Council. But he wants those cards. I mean, he's not going to bring in, like, Negate or Psychic Spiral Tormod's Crypt. <laughs> not, I don't think, Jace either. And Geist of St. Traff seems like it's pretty bad against Cartel Aristocrat or Silverblade Paladin. Right. So um, it looks like maybe the five there. He's, he's, most of his decks are already pretty well set up here. Like, Okay. Um, incidentally, Luis, we've got a question coming in uh, from Cover It Live. Luis, which version of Blue, White, Red would you play in an upcoming tournament? Would you play Larson's, or would you play Jerry T's? After seeing the way that the Boros Charms have played out, I really like uh, Larson's deck, but I would 
guaranteed be playing a harvest a harvest pirate in either one. So I think I think the harvest pirate just adds a dimension to your deck that is really good. So so a hybrid of the two. So you're saying a hybrid of the two strategies where uh, you you just taking the blasphemous axe out perhaps and putting in the harvest pyre, or even just going one, or even just going one and one. So uh, what about Tom Martell then? How do you see uh, this shaping up? Uh, the tragic slips are pretty important for killing Restoration Angels or Thunder Maws, and he's got to be aware that those are like, you know, the biggest problems for him. And you, you've already mentioned the Obzidat Ghost Council as something that is just a threat that Larson's deck really can't deal with. Yeah, it, it gets around Wrath and Blasphemous Act, or Supreme Verdict and Blasphemous Act, so he might bring it in. It might be a little too slow. Like, I like I haven't played as, you know, with Martel's deck, sure. so, but where I've played quite a bit with Joel's, so it's a little tougher to say. But I imagine the Skurzdag High Priests are not really where he wants to be. Right. And Knight of Infamy might actually not, not quite do it. It does get past Augur Bolas, but... What, what, what do you think? I mean, any, anything to, like, rest in peace? Like, so much of what Joel ends up doing is, like, Snapcastering and, you know, cards in his graveyard. Is, is I, I that think a card you'd ever consider? It seems like it doesn't do anything. No, I think it's probably too risky to bring in rest in peace just to shut off Snapcaster. If he had the Harvest Pyre, it'd be more of like a, you know, cat and mouse game, but... With just Snapcaster, it's, you're, you're you're not you're guaranteed to lose a card when you draw rest in base. You're not guaranteed to get a card back for it. Right. So there you see the two sideboards. The players will be gearing up for game two. I'd be very interested to find out. Cover it live. Did this poll with all of you at home, seeing what you thought the odds were of who was going to win the final. It was very much 50-50. But certainly, the gentleman with me here in the booth thought that Tom Martel really needed to win game one. He has not, of course. So I wonder how that poll is going right now. I wonder if uh, Larson is pulling ahead in that one as he has here in game one. He needs two out of the next four. What a bunch of bandwagon jumpers <laughs> those people would have to be. Well, the thing is, anyone who's <laughs> up a game is incredibly favored just because they're up a game. It doesn't even matter about the rest as much, but uh, yeah. But that said, we talk about how hard it is to win pro two Pro Tours. We talked about Ben Stark possibly doing that, and yourself, you've been so close. Right now, this is the first time in the whole weekend anyone has been favored to win the Pro Tour. <laughs> and that, it happens to true. be Joel Larson. Literally, this is the first minute that someone can say, I've got a better chance than anyone else. So it sounds like Joel Larson did sideboard as, as you predicted, and it, you know it seems. I mean, the Thunderbolt Hellcat just either, either the threat of them are going to either you know deal with like lingering souls or you know force maybe Tom to side out his lingering souls even. Yeah, Tom definitely has to play differently, knowing that they're there. Like he can't just sit behind a board of souls and be you know be happy with it. I think there are a lot of Tom Martell fans on Cover It Live because it's only 53-47 in favor of Larson. And then and then for Tom, it's it's tragic slips and ups and ats. So, Tom Martell is going to keep, and he will begin at game two. Well, you know, it's, it's not like uh, it's not like Joel can't kill an opposite at I mean, he can six mana Searing Spear Snapcaster Mage it, right? Like, yeah, it, it is it is possible. Joel's opening hand is uh, a little light on creatures. Oh, there's a Snapcaster. That certainly helps. But he had Moment of Heroism and Searing Spear and the Boros Charm, so he's kind of setting up the infinite life combo there. He's got two of the three pieces. So in comes the first point of damage from Tom Martell. Two lands from Joe Larson. He passes. And then uh, you mentioned moment of heroism. <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, is that actually? Yeah, yeah. That's that's a card in his deck. <laughs> when we play tested his deck, we had one because the list that was kind of going around the line had one for a while, and it was surprisingly good. Like just for a card that you'd think of as a you know a good fifth pick, <laughs> right, as, as a third of an Azorius charm and a Selesnya charm yeah. combined, right? Like yeah, yeah. I mean, it has its moments, that's for sure. There's the Silver Blade Paladin, smash you for four. Well, I suspect it's going to be a little less. He's got a Searing Spear. <laughs> And by a down. little less, you mean a lot See? less. It is actually unfortunate for Tom here. He had to name Human with Cavern, and uh, he's got Obzidat in his hand and a look like a Reckoner. So it's good, or just an Obzidat, but it's just going to be much, he basically only has two lands in play for his five mana spell, except for the colorless part. So Martel draws up to five cards in hand now. Let me see, get a look at his hand, do Traveler Tragic Slap. His hand is pretty good. And then an Orzhov charm that uh, he drew, I think, this turn. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, he, he's got a pretty decent board, and Joel, well, drawing Restoration Angel definitely helps, because now Joel can kill uh, the Champion of the Parish and with Snapcaster, and then, like, set up a snap Restoration Angel on Snapcaster, but Obzidat is going to do some work if Tom draws a fifth land here. Looks like he did. Mm. And has, yet yeah, double black, double white, so I would advise that he plays that this turn. Congratulations, you have a solid B from the internet for <laughs> it has its moments. Yeah. Well, most of the ones I say don't have a ghost of a chance, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, we... That wasn't meant to encourage you. Well, I mean, a B is yeah. an upgrade from what he gets from Pat Cox. Usually. Yeah, Pat Cox, uh, uh, wildness, wildest Nakata on Twitter, was the progenitor of grading my puns. For Champion of the Parish bites the dust to the Searing Spear, but... Boom. We saw Aurelia the War Leader earlier today, and now we see Obsidat Ghost Council. Of course. <laughs> of course, it's Joel Larson. <laughs> yeah. I can't what we were talking about earlier. He, he kind of needs, you know, two removal spells to hit that guy. So he needs like a Searing Spear and another Searing Spear, or a Searing Spear and a Pillar of Flame, or a Snapcaster Mage to get in the mix somewhere in there. And yeah. He's just used up one of those resources. Yeah, I mean, he he can potentially go for the double block here with Restoration Angel, but it's not going to end well. It's going to actually end pretty tragically because Tom's hand is all removal. <coughs> so Larson oh, down to nine. Snap cast a mage. Oh, no. That's an aggressive tragic slip because now mm -hmm. he can just lead off with the Restoration Angel. I mean, Tom's still really far ahead, but... Sure, and we, we, there is a Boros Charm in, in uh, Joel's hand, so he, if he can get creatures in front with some, a little bit of mana open, he can also indestructible. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he can go for it. The problem is if he takes five damage here, he ends up in a pretty bad spot. Uh, it looks like Tom's just going to run back the Tragic Slip. And even the Restoration Energy, he can just double strike it with the Boros Charm. Yep. Yeah, Tom's getting at least five damage in here unless Joel blocks, which is not 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 going to put him in a good spot no matter what happens. Joel is already wow, he's already at nine. It's down to four, and then down to two. Yeah, and he's got not a whole lot of action in hand. The things could work out well for him here if Tom attacks. I don't think Tom, I think Tom's just going to sit back and flicker because it's much safer, but if he attacks, moment of heroism in response or result term in response indestructible. Right. Okay, can look at the ghost council as it's whittling away Joel's life total. Yeah, yeah. I mean Joel's just dead to it flickering unless he has to like main phase moment and attack for first. <laughs> mostly lazy, mostly dead, but not on this occasion. Yeah very much alive for Tom Martell and keeping his Pro Tour hopes alive as well because he may well be heading for 1-1 here in the final. It's not incredibly relevant here, and then Tom just passes and flickers, and Joel has to like main phase the here the moment. Hmm. Hopefully, he doesn't have to forget his ghost council trigger. Is it gone forever if you forget it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Joel's just just dead now, but he does. I mean, he can maybe bluff Martell into not attacking with the Ghost Council again. We are so heading for 1-1. I love the way you're trying to get Joe Larson out of this one. He might forget his trigger. He could... Yeah, no. I mean, when you're in the you're in the finals of Pro Tour, you grasp it at any and all spots. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. Smash. 
one one Smash there we go <laughs> all right so we're down to the best of three here in the final it's joe larson one tom martell one so a good creature that he is as well. Ultra Pro is the leading manufacturer of trading card game sleeves and deck boxes. If you're looking for official gate crash portfolios, card storage boxes, deck boxes, sleeves and playmats, Ultra Pro has you covered. For more information, visit wizards.com forward slash magic merchandise. All right, gentlemen, I want to take a quick look. We've sort of done some tallying and uh, started looking around the world at how the overall performance is. Uh, and it pains me to say that we're going to begin with the top Americans and let's see if we can take a look at how they've done because, oh, you mighty, mighty, mighty Magic Nation, you have done incredible work this weekend. Ben Stock, top eight. Next. Well, it's Owen Turtonweld. Yeah, top eight. Next. Yeah, top eight. Melissa Dottore. Next. Jerry Thompson. You know what he did. He was in the top eight. Who else was in the top eight? They're all Americans. Tom Martell, top eight, of course. Eric Froelich, top eight, of course. And Stephen Mann. And you're thinking, OK, well, surely there can't have been many Americans left to be further up in the top echelon. Let's see who the next American player is. It's Robert <laughs> Roberto Gonzalez. Someone you know pretty ninth. well, right? Yeah, he, uh, he's from New Mexico. And uh, actually, my roommate in college was also from New Mexico, uh, Matt Benjamin. And they, they all used to play at the same PTQs. And so I, I've known R Roberto for a couple for a long time, actually. And, and I think he has a link back to Tom Martell, apparently. Tom Martell like, played him in the finals of one of the early PTQs that Tom won in his career. Oh, okay. I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they go back. I mean, all around that same uh, Southern California. Yeah, like they, they would sometimes travel. Like, I actually saw Roberto at a PTQ in Denver now that I lived there a couple months ago. He was tremendously impressive. I tweeted this morning looking forward to the top nine because I wanted to say how well I thought he conducted himself all weekend and just a tremendous, tremendous value, a great addition to the, the tournament scene. So that's it for Americans? No, keep going. <laughs> Dave Shields in 10th. Someone I have a lot of time for. I think he's... Uh, a tremendous young player. Yeah. So you have Dave Shields in 10th. And then Conley Woods, who was under the <laughs> radar because he was always one round behind the curve. And ultimately, he dominated with his mono black deck that we did a deck tech on in the back stretch of day two, but not quite in time to pull him into the top eight. L Luis has a pretty funny story about uh, Conley coming down to that last round. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to the last round. We know Conley's either going to be able to play for top eight or draw into top 16. We're like, Conley, what are you going to do? He's like, I'm just going to play. We're like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm not looking at the standings. I'm just going to play. And we're like, yeah, that's probably not a great idea. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and do a little math. And it turns out he, he would have gotten like ninth or 10th, probably 10th. And if he draws, he's in the top 16. So, so he intentionally drew with his opponent. Little uh, public information announcement. Uh, just got a message through. There is a new clause in the new Miss Trigger rules now. If he forgets, Obzadat goes council actually does come back says head judge Toby Elliott. All right. And since he's level five, I'm going to assume he knows what he's talking about. Is that a rule specifically for Obzadat, or is it just like a more general rule? I mean, Toby and Tom know each other a long time. <laughs> 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 Toby has head judged a number of PTQs I've played at and or won, just because he was a little Bay Area local. Right, right. So, uh, there we go. It is time for game three. It is the best of three now for 40,000 US dollars between Joel Larson on the left and Tom Martell on the right of screen. It is a, what is that? Is that a planes that's yeah. come into play? I thought everyone only played <laughs> multi-lands these days. Yeah, uh, Joel's cavern's gonna do a lot of work on uh, wizards here. I think. Well, mm -hmm. he drew a Glacial Fortress, so that helps. But he kept a Reckoner Augur hand, and so uh, <laughs> his cavern, there's a crossover between Minotaurs and Merfolk. Oh. <laughs> so, Augur of Bolas. Joel takes a look at three, as he must. Sounds like Aurora's charm is in his future. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That Tries sets up the infinite. Well, he's, you see, he's also got an Azorius charm there. So, um, and he, in fact, takes the Azorius charm. I suppose that does let him cycle for uh, for lands, but he, he's not he's not interested in going infinite quite yet. <laughs> uh, I can confirm, obviously, that that's a general rule, not just for Tom yeah. Martell's and not just for Pro Tour Finals. So, yeah, if you if you miss that. Well, that's that. much better then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Right. Back to the action. Interesting to see Tom playing very uh, conservatively with his mana. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to take two here. In for one with the Augur of Bolas. It's already netted Joel the card, and now it attacks for one. And here is Boros Reckoner. Do we know if you name Minotaur or Wizard? 
<laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Benatar. <laughs> uh, you were wrong, Brian. It was, in fact, <laughs> Wizard. All right, let's take a look at the hand cards in Joel's hand. What do you think about this hand, Luis? It's a good one. He has a sulfur vents in his deck, or falls in his hand, which is going to come into play tapped, but it's it's a pretty stacked hand. It's got a lot of action. So, I mean, he, with a Reckoner in play, he's, he's in the short term ahead at this point. So it puts a counter on Champion of the Parish from Night of Infamy and attacks into the Reckoner for three damage. Tom was not interested in casting a Reckoner this turn, but Knight of Infamy gets three in it either way. Cliff Dopper Cheater, very good draw, because now he can, like, pillar away the champion or the Knight of Infamy. And he does send it at the, uh, 13. At the Knight. Go. Yeah, the one thing about Martel's deck is his champions aren't incredibly <coughs> scary. It's not like a Naya Humans deck. Joel has a pretty reasonable expectation of it not growing, though it looks like it will this turn, so it's going to be out of the second pillar ridge. Boros Reckoner, Augur of Bolas, left. Champion of the Parish, one counter, right. 1-1. One, one. It's so funny what Boros Reckoner does with this match, because Martel's now at the magic number of 13, and they always have to be aware of Blasphemous Act at this point. Does, does that change the number of creatures Tom Martel is willing to commit to the board? It, it has to. I mean, he's probably in a spot where he can't really hold back, but it is something, like, that sort of math, you have to add up the damage, the creatures, the mana, like... It, it definitely puts a strain on you, especially when you've been playing for four or five hours at this right. point. He, he's he's definitely looking for for what here? Like what's what what gets him above thirteen other than Vault of the Archangel? At this point, he prob he needs to like get Joel to thirteen and play his own Reckoner as one of his ways out. Yep. Attacking into Azorius Charm here would be really unfortunate for Tom. Not saying he shouldn't attack or anything, but Joel definitely wants him to. And that is what's going to happen because the Doom Traveler puts the extra counter on. There you see Azorius Charm. Yeah, that's, it's so brutal because now he has to draw 1-1 one, one with basically no ability for the next couple turns. Yep. Finishes off the turn with a Boris Reckoner to mirror the one on Joe's side of the board. He's a Boris Charm away from him. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a heck of a way to end... <laughs> a pro tour. Yeah. Because he even has the pillar to ping his own guy. Joel is in kind of a tough spot here, though. He's not... The Reckoner does shut down his Reckoner to some degree, so... It's... He, he can attack and trade, but he's not left with an actual kill condition. He needs to draw a Thunder Maw or another Reckoner pretty quickly. An Angel would also do the trick for at least a little while. In comes the Reckoner, alone. Augur of was staying back this time. With Pillar in hand, Attack with Augur is an interesting option, too, because if he blocks with Reckoner, you can Pillar to finish it off, un unless Martel points a point at the Reckoner, in which case you end up shooting a lot of cards. I think this is generally going to be better, but I'm not sure if he, how much he considered it. He a reminder that this is the best of five, so no one can win the Pro Tour in this game. We're at 1-1 in the best of five all day Sunday. We make it the best of five. We want to give the players the most chance to play their cards, to make the best plays, and uh, that's the way to do it. So this is game three of five, potentially. So uh, Joel gives his Reckoner first strike, uh, forcing Tom to not be able to get to, uh, you know, his, his Reckoner. Yeah, so... Yeah, it basically lets Joel do three to Tom's face, and yeah. Tom has to just point it back at the Reckoner. Right, right. Hurts. Three. Tom was tapped out, could not give his, his Reckoner first strike. Yeah, Tom has a lot of a lot more gas here, though. He's got another Reckoner and an Aristocrat and a Champion, so even though he's at a low life total, he's got he's he's got a lot of... He's slightly ahead, like, in terms of cards. If Joel needs to draw one of either, like, a Revelation or some more burn spells and convert his life total advantage to, to a victory. So, is he going to cycle Azorius Charm here, or is it too if, is it too valuable in terms of uh, keeping Tom from doing the things he wants to do? Well, if Tom attacked with Aristocrat, he might have, but since he didn't, Joel may just elect to go ahead and cycle it and try to find something. Like, a Thunder Maw is really what he's looking for now. Like, yeah. And he is going to cycle. He's going to see a land, I believe, of that. 
but of course that brings him one card what? nearer to Thundermore Hellkite, which is what he's now just drawn. He's a point away from winning now. I mean, assuming he just slams the Thundermore and gets in there. Land number six. Well, actually, Tom, oh, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a sack outlet yet, but he can make a Doom Traveler token right. next turn. He, can, he also has an Aristocrat to block, but Tom is on, on the precipice here of, of just dying to any burn spell. Sure. He could die to his own Orzhov Charm. He could. It's unlikely. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the Orzhov Charm, not, not an optimal draw. Though Aristocrat does keep the, the Thunder Mot Bay very effectively here. You have two birds. But there, you get a look at the Thundermore Hellkite that mm -hmm. uh, Tom has to uh, contend with. Yeah, it, it's a <laughs> it's a serious card. It, uh, the fact that it gets in for five with through blockers basically guaranteed, unless again Tom has like a Doom Traveler and a Sack Outlet, sure. is is impressive. That's what it takes to get a good five mana creature. And five mana was a good slot in M13 <laughs> apparently. Good slot for Planeswalkers, for yeah. creatures, <laughs> for Gilded <of> Lotus. <laughs> Tom Martell there, the trying to of M13, five. Yeah, He's trying to find a way out. So here comes the Aristocrat. Part of the reason the deck's named that way. <laughs> Rearranges his creatures. He might just get super aggressive here. Yeah, it looks so like it looks he is. Like, yeah. So it's Reckoner and Aristocrat that he pushes into the red zone, oh, and whoops. that is the final that attack. So. Joe will just take it. He will untap. He drew a land. That Orzo Charm is actually going to be very good here. Returning Doom Traveler to play, letting him make two 1 1 tokens. Oh, wow. So Tom, Tom is actually going to win now unless Joel draws a burn spell. Or somehow thinks not to attack. Yeah, he can't really block the Aristocrat either, is the unfortunate part. So attack, in come the team. He's got a way to win here, though. If Tom, if Tom manages to not chump Agro Bolas with Champion, then then Joel actually just gets to pillar him to death. Spirit. Yep. So I get a spirit. Counter goes on the aristocrat. Oh, yeah, it looks like his one one's gonna perish here. So. Tom's Seems gonna like stay alive. Plan. So, block, block. Or, is this one of those I'm doing this, I'm not doing this moments for Tom? Part of the risk here is that Tom doesn't, I don't think he quite has lethal here. If he does block with the champion, looks like block. he's not gonna take the risk though. Huh? No, he's actually got exactly lethal, sorry, because he could return a 1 1 of Thor's up turn. Right. So, so Larson passes the turn. And although it is 10-3 in his favor, Tom Martel now untaps with the chance to take a 2-1 lead. Yeah, unless unless he's worried about Azorius Charm Run Summon, he's probably just going to go for it. He confirms that Larson has two cards in hand. Doom Traveler did some work here. <laughs> it's, and it's not done. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's got one more uh, soul to give here. Why do I keep coming back here? <laughs> Nothing good ever happens yeah. to me. <laughs> well, there's, you know, those destructive life patterns, they just... Yeah, it looks like Tom's going for it. One mana, two mana. Ores of Charm. Bring back my Doom Traveler, sacrifice it, put a third counter on Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, and Joel Scoop scoops turn. up his cards, and Tom Martell is within one game of being a Pro Tour champion. He leads Joel Larson of Sweden by two to one. We'd like to thank Cardhouse Games for being an official card retailer here at Pro Tour Gatecrash. For all things magic, Cardhouse Games is one of the premier destinations on the internet. For more information, visit cardhouse.com.
so. We saw the top 10 Americans, which looked suspiciously like the top 10 finishers. <laughs> What, I mean, seriously, boys, what a fantastic performance. But let's take a look at Europe. And here we go. We begin with Joe Larson, who, of course, could still be your Pro Tour champion. And then we go outside the top eight, as we must. Let's see who we've got. So next up, we have Emmanuel Souter. He ID'd, I think, with Conley Woods in the last round uh, to finish 11th. Um, a pretty impressive German player uh, recently uh, up in the top eights of European GPs. On we go. We have uh, Juan Carlos Adobo Diaz uh, from Spain making it into the top 16. Next up was Tomek Pedrakovsky, a story we were following through the weekend. This is the man who was 8-0 at Pro Taravis in Restored last year. Um, the, won the Gold Magic Online Qualifier for this event. His brother Pavel was in the mix. Really great weekend for the brothers. In fact, his brother, his brother Pavel was ahead of him for most of uh, the, the day mm -hmm. one in the standings. And then they, uh, he, Tom, Tomek probably a little sibling rivalry uh, leapfrogged ahead of him. Absolutely. The fifth place European finisher was Jan Lucas Spano, who did tremendous work in standard particularly. He was the last undefeated standard player lost the last couple of rounds though I think to end up 17. Re really one experiment one evolve counter away from being represented in this top eight. Yeah against Eric Froelich yeah, it was a really close game. So uh, that was Spanu on we go next up is Raf Levy as usual making the top 32 of a pro tour because he's just amazing at that let's carry on. We have Lucas Tajak of Germany again in the top 32 well done to him then we have Christophe Rolau, the top uh, Frenchman just behind Raph Levy. Those two are almost interchanging. And then we have Raymond Venus of the Netherlands. Again, he was top 32. And finally, the 10th placed European finisher was Alessandro Portaro of Italy. I thought uh, that's, I mean, that's still a good showing for the Italians. Two in the top 32. I thought that Portaro or maybe Samuel Estrati might be still with us today. But there we are. That's the top finishers for uh, Europe. Wor worth noting, Rafael Levy there in 19th place, playing an identical deck to Melissa de Toro. They were they were playing on the TCG player team and sort of working together for this event. So, uh, you know, good showing by that deck, not played by uh, a ton of people. Yeah, they had a really good record in standard. So let's uh, move away from Europe and we'll round up the rest of the world, the top finishers for you. And so let's see what we've got. And there's an interesting storyline to tell you <coughs> here. So first we have the Chilean, Felipe Tapia Becerra. He was right near the top of the standings throughout the weekend. Second place in this uh, file is John Stern. Well done, Canada. In the top 16 for John. He now he was, again, one like Conley, one round right. shy. Just if it had been 17 rounds, he might have been in the top eight. The proverbial Let local hero. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Uh, we have Isaac Egan from Australia. He was right in the mix. Um, and in fact, if he had won his last round, I think he might have edged in ahead of Mann and Gonzalez, but ends up 18th. Still, top 25 guarantees him coming back. So well done him. Next up, we have Shahar Shenhar. So he's down as Israel. That's where he's living right now. Sort of dual citizenship. Obviously, you think of him as an American. He'd have been right in that mix. <laughs> well, he's someone you, you, you've gotten to see a lot of him growing up and playing magic. <laughs> yeah. what, what do you think of this young guy? I, I met Shahar when he was like 14 or something and much, much shorter than me. Right, he, was only, he was only 6'2 <laughs> then. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, now he is much taller and has many more pro points than me. But <laughs> <laughs> Let's to whiz through the rest of this list because the players are gearing up for the fourth game. Makahita Mahara of Japan, the top uh, Japanese player in 28th. And let's carry on straight down. Mat Matias Martins of Brazil. Who's next? We're away. Let's cut from this. We are into game four. Don't want to miss a thing. Bye-bye, rest of the world. Hello, game four of the Pro Tour. Let's get to the match. And we have a turn one play from Tom Martel. It is champion of the parish. It's going to be held at bay by uh, an auger of Bolas that whiffs uh, off the top of uh, Joel's deck. Not only whiffs, it sends a thunder mod at the bottom is what it looked like. And that, oh. that, that does not bode well. It's not a good auger. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> bad, bad auger. <laughs> only two uh, thunder more hell kites in the deck. And it looks like Martel's got an aggressive strike. I, I was just going to say, when he, when, he, when he slammed that land into play, yeah. uh, untapped, took two yeah. life. You, you knew that meant three damage coming in. Absolutely. So now, already, it's going to have to be shields up for Joel Larson. No question about who's the early beat down in this one. He lays a, a land. It's tapped. Doesn't want to take any damage. And Martel draws. So with, without another human, this actually offense, as fast as it started, is nice. <laughs> kind of back to grinding to a halt. Cause so, so let's take a look at what these guys have to work with. Uh, trying to get the 
hand up. So he sends in two. So one of them is a 3-3, one is a 2-2. So Joel will presumably put the Augur Boas in front of the 2-2. And then Searing Spear will look to take out the 3-3. And that is, as you say, Luis, very much a kind of yeah. grind to a halt. Yeah, I mean, he's probably going to try to slip the Augur here. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, now he has a 2-2 two -two and a 1-1. One -one, and so Joel doesn't have a lot going on either, though. He's got a Snapcaster to, to kill one of the uh, champions again. But... Martel's double Falcon Rathers credit are gonna, is going to be pretty hard for Joel to beat unless he draws okay, some that, action. That Searing Spear is not in hand. He, he just used it mm -hmm. yeah. on the champion of the parish. He may be using it again very shortly. Looks like Martel has a million Falcon Rathers credits in hand, but at the moment, I don't think he can cast them. It does not have a red source in play. Perks. So four cards for Joel Larson. He just drew a third Falcon Rathers aristocrat. Yep. I mean, if he's going to win, you'd like him to win with the aristocrats. So <laughs> sure. So Snapcaster can just trade for this board here if that's what he wants, or a tragic slip. It's up to Martel. I mean, presumably he does want that, doesn't he, Larson? Doesn't he want to get the ball clear at this point? Yeah, for sure. So Snapcaster for Searing Spear. Searing Spear, kill your champion. Yep. Tragic slip. So if Joel draws a big threat here and Martel doesn't draw red, he's in, a, he's in okay shape. No, well, Reckoner does well, help. Well, yep. There it comes. And Tom all out of tragic slips. He drew a cavern, though, so it's game on. Here we go. In with the aristocrat. It's got to get sent to the top of the library via Azorius Charm. But that, that's it for so Joel's action know. cards right now. Yeah. He's, he's got a cliff top retreat. I, I think we've got a pretty good shot of having Martel be our Pro Tour champion, unless Joel peels a Thunder Maw or something pretty big. And that wasn't pretty big. That was a land. In comes the Boros Reckoner. Yeah, because once an unopposed Falcon Wrath comes out, then next turn there's two coming out, and Joel's like in a huge hole. So. Off comes from the top of the library, Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. Tom Martel didn't even bother untapping his lands. He knows what his plan is. His plan is to be a Pro Tour champion about three or two turns from now. Joe Larson, Boros Reckoner, he finds an Augur of Bolas. He goes to the top of his library. Three cards. What are we seeing there? Land, land, another Augur of Bolas. That's not what you want to see, Joe Larson. He sends in Boros Reckoner. You go. You go. Mar Though Joel is a blasphemous fact away from, from just winning. So, massive moments here in the final of Pro Tour Gate Crash 2013 from the fabulous Canadian city of Montreal. Three great days are we moments oh, yeah. away from the oh, finish. Or, or is he? Not okay. anymore. Yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> we see that a Boris Reckoner has been drawn by Tom Which Martel. Actually a great draw for Tom. It cuts off one of Joel's easiest routes to victory. Ready? And He's, Tom's going to take the opportunity to, to drop it down. Here's Boros Reckner on Tom Martel's side of the board. Joe Larson, what are you drawing? You're drawing another land. I believe any, we, we've got a winner here. Any Do minute believe? now, Tom Martel is going to realize a dream here in Montreal. He's played with nope. Fireball. He's played with Star City. Right now, he is on the brink of a Pro Tour title with the aristocrats. Here's another aristocrat. Joel nods. In they come. And Tom Martel of the United States is your Pro Tour Gate Crash champion for 2013. He got the job done and it was the aristocrats that turned sideways to take the title from Joel Larson of Sweden. Congratulations, Tom Martel. Wow, goodness gracious me. Guys, terrific performance by Tom Martel. We thought he couldn't get out of the quarterfinals. And when Eric Froelich got a bye in round one, we started talking about seizing the opportunity. And Eric Froelich made it all the way to the top eight. When Tom Martel got out of the quarterfinals, he sensed blood and he took it all the way. And, and you know what? He's, he's been playing great, thoughtful magic. 
you know, people dismiss. I mean, obviously, this is a very complicated aggro deck <laughs> with a lot of things. That, as we said, we don't even know all the things this deck does. But a lot of people will dismiss a, a, a deck full of small creatures as like a kitty deck. Is but you see how many decisions and all the implications that were in play at every every turn. All right, we're going to get straight down to the floor of the top eight, where waiting to hand the trophy to Tom Martel is Pro Tour <laughs> tournament organizer, Mr. Scott Larrabee. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pro Tour Gate Crash Champion from the United States, Tom Martell. I'd like to thank all the staff, the judges, and the players for making this webcast such a great success. Join us May 17 to 19, 2003 for the webcast of Pro Tour Dragon's Maze from San Diego. Thank you and good night. All right, so there you see your Pro Tour Gate Crash champion with the Aristocrats from the United States, as 87.5% of the time it was going to be today. <laughs> it is from the US, Tom Martell. Fantastic performance, and boy, he was an emotional man there as he raised the trophy. That meant a ton. And you've been there, Luis. What is that moment like? It's when pretty you raise incredible. The trophy? There's like really nothing else like it so i'm really happy for tom it's pretty awesome seeing him win all right i can tell you that the guys at the desk are ready for us we'll get tom martell's response <laughs> to winning his pro tour bdm great weekend uh, ab absolutely amazing weekend great standard format uh terrific draft format and uh you know just a room full of great players and it's been uh, a real pleasure having you in the booth with us yeah it's been awesome I, pleasure I, and I, I say this with <laughs> the best intentions i hope we can't have you here again <laughs> yeah. in san diego all right a completely pleasure. agree <laughs> Pleasure and an honor. Luis Scott Vargas, Brian David Marshall, Rich Hagen. Let's hand you back to the news desk and Marshall Sutcliffe. Whoa! Tom Martell, Pro Tour champion here, and that was some exciting stuff. I know I was looking at the chat in the uh, on the uh, stream, yeah, uh -huh. and man, there was a lot of people rooting for Tom on that one, and they're really happy that he was able to take this down. We're actually going to bring Tom in right now. As he takes a deep well, breath there. on his way in, we're going to get a Pro Tour champ. Congratulations, Tom. Good to see you. Thank you very much. It's great That's to be a here. Nice piece of hardware. It is. Yeah. It is. It's <laughs> a little larger than the GB one. I'm kind of happy. <laughs> now, New Zach, I know you had a question. Thing. I know you had a question for Ooh. Tom about um, an earlier match. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say. You know, you were talking in the hotel earlier when we, when we had a conversation about how the matchup with Melissa not yep. very good. You were very worried about it. You end up winning that match in 3-1 pretty decisively. How did uh, what played out differently? Uh, different I got very lucky, I mean, to be honest. I, mean, there was, I think I played pretty well in the match. Oh, yeah? uh, she double mulligan in game two. She sure. mulligan in game three. Um, and so I think the, those things obviously broke in my favor. She, I think her sideboard plan, it didn't line up with what we were doing. And I don't sure. think maybe they didn't find the sideboard plan that we had found for her, uh, which we thought was really good. She actually slowed her deck down a lot and boarded uh -huh. out her augers and her center healers, which played right into my hand because I boarded all my expensive cards and powerful cards and just put in every human I had. Oops, we're not getting the... No, Mike. No, Mike. Right, well, what he's saying wasn't second. important anyway. It wasn't, it really wasn't very insightful. <laughs> hey, that's Pro Tour champion <laughs> Tom Martell. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, so what I was saying was, um, I mean, I got very lucky because she mulliganed games, games uh, two and three. Sure. Double mulligan in two, so that certainly played and helped me out. And then her sideboarding plan, which was to go bigger and go more powerful, right. bringing in her Planeswalkers, actually bringing in her Gisela, really? which into yeah. my Zealous Conscript seems a little risky. Uh, and boarding out her auger bolses and her center healers, sure. which to be fair is the first thing I suggested to her sideboard. We tried that, uh, but we discovered that it was actually just, we thought not boarding at all, she was a huge favorite. Really? And so anything that may slowed her down gave me a chance to kind of get out and head and push through damage. And then the turn she plays Thrag Test to try to stabilize, I can conscript it or come over the top and kill her. And that's a lot of damage. Right, and that's how we basically won those games. Is, is, you know, she wants us to kind of stall out the early game to, to be able to get those revelations online. And thankfully that's not how it played out. And I was able to, uh, to squeak that one out. Now you tested for this tournament with Team Star City Games. Yes. And uh, Sam Black has been getting a lot of uh, recognition for the design of this deck. Can you give us a little history on how the deck formed? Sure, I mean, so if you're familiar with kind of the deck Sam likes to play, you know, for instance, his legacy deck that he's played a lot of, that Zombies deck. He loves decks that use creatures that gain incremental value as they kind of trade up and down and, and gives just a lot of play to the deck. Not necessarily the most you know, brute force powerful cards, although the deck has some of those too, but you know, Doom Traveler, not really a constructed powerhouse. Right. But 
well, arguably the, one of the top three cards in the deck. It's better than Champion of the Parish deck by a lot. Um, and so it's, it's he first tried like a, a zombie shell. Mm -hmm. That didn't really work out. It wasn't quite getting there. Tried, you know, Blood Artist, which is a, a pet card of his, uh, kind of proxies the Goblin Barman that we see in Legacy. Didn't quite get there there. So then he moved to a human shell. And I don't know, I was saying from, from very early on, actually I got smashed on Moto by a deck that played Falkenrath Aristocrat, Boros Charm, and Boros Reckoner. I said, I want to play those three cards in my deck. What's the best shell we can build around that? I don't even know if Sam heard me saying this. I mean, we got lodged in the back of his mind, but he was just taking away. He kept mm -hmm. you know, iterating and found this shell, which played two of those three cards. Right. Uh, Boros Charm didn't quite fit in the, the plan. We cut that, but the, you know, the deck was great. Now, speaking of legacy, uh, this is another event you've won with Lingering Souls. It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, the, the, the card has treated me very well. Thank you, whoever in design or R and D printed that card, because you've really <laughs> you made me a lot of money and got me a lot of pro points. It's your honorary invitational card at this point. It basically, I mean, that card is has done some work for me. So, yeah, thank you for that one. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, you have made a pro tour top eight before in I have. Paris. What was it like coming to this one? Did you feel more or less prepared mentally? Way was it easier prepared. for you? Oh, yeah. Way better. So in Paris, I actually had just contracted pneumonia the day oh. before and didn't even realize it yet. If you remember, Paris had that Saturday off. Yes. The tournament ended on Friday. And I woke up Saturday around noon with 103 degree fever in wow. downtown Paris, not speaking any French. So I was not the best mindset going into that top right. eight match. I was very nervous. And, you know, playing against Ben, who's an excellent player in a very complicated mirror match, just the first time I ever played the deck, I was just much less prepared. Um, and, and, and so I didn't really know what I was doing, and I definitely played much worse there. Uh -huh. Here, you know, I'd been there once before. Since then, I've made a couple of GP top eights as well. Also I've won a GP. I've won one. So I experienced winning. I've now experienced losing more. I wasn't nearly as nervous. I said, hey, it's a great run. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, you know, in recent PTs, I've really struggled in limited. So I kind of, right. I 6 0 drafted this one, thankfully, and kind of looked at this as a free roll. It's like, hey, this is awesome. I even made top eight. I locked platinum with top eight. Anything Fantastic. from here is gravy. And that mentality really kept me calm. Against, totally. against Ephra, like, I mold the five on the play. Often, like, old me would have tilted that one off immediately and said, right. man, this sucks. You look so really unfair. calm after that. I mean, it's magic. And these things happen. You resign yourself yeah. to that happening. You're going to play the cards. And I get five of them and play the best of my ability. And I'm going to make work what I can with those five cards. And hopefully, I'll get there. If I don't, I don't. It's fine. Ephra's a great guy, and he deserves to win as much as anyone. Oh. And, and that change in my mentality where I'm not angry at the universe for making me get unlucky, I think has really helped my game evolve in the last the last kind of couple months. And the, and the reality is, to get to the top eight, you have to get quite lucky oh, of course. on your oh, account, too. Obviously, so yeah. Anyone, you know. anyone at this stage is you're getting insanely lucky over and over again. <laughs> There's no 90-10, you know, magic matches. Most of our decks matchups are like 55-45, 58-42. You're winning a lot of, you know, slightly weighted coin flips, so to make it here, that, that takes luck no matter what happens. Now, you, you've been there before. You took it down this time. You know, I, I took a look, and, and right after the match was over, I saw you, and you just, you looked yes. like let out of breath. What does it mean to you to have won this Pro Tour? Oh, it's it's incredible. I mean, my it, it's funny how your kind of your magic career goes in stages. You know, my, my goal for a long time was I want to top eight a, a, a GP. So I did that. I lost in the finals. Like, man, I want to win a GP. And then I top eight a Pro Tour. Like, man, I want to win a Pro Tour and a GP. And then I won the GP. I'm like, all right, now I got to win a Pro Tour. And actually, during Ephraim's match, I rolled the five against his very aggressive deck. Yeah. Like, he really punished me against. I thought I was dead. I, I thought there's the only way I can really win is Reckoner act on five cards. And it didn't even occur to me. I'm like, this is so bad. It's fine though. I guess I gotta make another top eight now. You know, I, I'm gonna have to win the next one. And, and it kind of, I, the fire actually sparked me for the next tournament. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we kind of carried it out through this one. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling, and I'm so thrilled to, to be here. I can't, wouldn't be here without my team, which has done just an amazing job for me, and I can't thank them enough for all the support. And, and I had you know an army of people testing in between rounds here for me, figuring out matchups, and it's it's amazing. Okay, well, you also have an army of people very happy that you won. I'm sure and you'll get the, the even Twitter more avalanche actually. as it comes in, but you had a yeah. ton of people rooting for you. I have one last question. I have one more answer. Is this your lucky scarf now? I, John is not getting this back, so I don't know if, <laughs> if you guys heard the story. No, we didn't. But, so no, this, I didn't this know morning, the we're we're at the hotel, uh, kind of, I overslept a little bit. I text John, hey, let's meet up. So John and I are in a cab here, and we walk out. I'm wearing my, my jacket. And he has his hat on and his scarf, and his jacket. He's like, you don't even have a hat? I'm like, no, I'm from California. I don't really own, like, beanies or anything. He's like, he takes off the scarf. I'm holding coffee, a bag, and another bag over my shoulder. Puts the scarf around me, ties it around my neck. I'm like, uh, whatever the hands of John Finkel make, <laughs> I'm not taking off. I'm yeah, not undoing that. Right. And unfortunately, John left, so I don't know how I'm going to get it off, because I'm not the one who's going to do it. So we'll see what happens. I might be wearing this for a while now. All right, Tom. Well, congratulations. Thank you Great so much. Great work this weekend. Great job, man. Everybody's yeah. very happy for you. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate all the, all the support. All right, guys. We're ready to sign off here for Montreal. Woo. That was a heck of a weekend, Zach. Exactly. Are you tired? I am tired. It's so much excitement. It's hard to not like get drained after. I don't know what's going to happen. You're probably going to 
fall down after this thing. I actually so missed much my stress. flight home, so I'm actually going to go out to karaoke and have some hey, fun. Hey, so there you it worked go. Out for me. <laughs> well, maybe I'll join you. So I next weekend, <laughs> we're going to be in, uh, in Quebec City for the Grand Prix, so join us there on the webcast for Zach Hill, for Tom Martell, for everybody else here doing coverage, playing, and participating in this event. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, and we're signing off from Montreal.